Hi, I welcome you, and I'm glad to see you this morning on the chat. I bless you all right now in the name of Jesus. I bless you all to know Jesus more wonderfully as we go into this time. I bless you to be healed now in the name of Jesus, healing in your body, in your mind, in your emotions, and in your spirit. I bless you to know the guidance of God and the help of God in your life right now. I bless you to flourish and prevail in this season, whatever your challenges might be. And I, and I bless you in the name of Jesus that you would experience on the inside the, the love, the joy, the hope, and the peace of God. May it be for you now. May that be true for you in your situation. I bless you with that in the name of Jesus. All right, welcome back. Welcome back to our series entitled The Bible Land and Biblical Faith. And in case you are new here or are, have been away for a few weeks, we are learning together what the Bible Land is like. And we're looking at different regions throughout the Bible Land. Uh, and we're going to see what they look like with pictures and things like that. We're going to be talking about the different strengths and weaknesses or challenges of each area. And what different lessons the people who lived in that area needed to learn in order for them in their lives, in their situations, in their context, learn to live out what faith is really looks like in the day-to-day. -day. Not just this faith out there, but what faith looks like day-to-day. -day. Here's a map of, of kind of the places we've been talking about. They're all circled in blue there. We've kind of gone north to south following Abraham and his journey. Um, with last week's message ending up at the very south down there, this area called the Negev, which is a very dry, dry area. Today we're going to learn about uh, the heartland of, of Judah, uh, what the Bible calls the hill country of Judah. As you can see on these next two maps here together, the, the map on the left is, is the same map that we've been um, adding to. We are going to be talking about a big chunk of the area called the hill country of Judah. It's right in the middle. This is the heart of the land. On the second map, a much more detailed map, you can see that it sits between the land of Benjamin, which we talked about a few weeks ago, and it goes all the way down to the Negev, and it's bordered by the, the wilderness and the Shephelah, which we will be talking about next week. Um, but we're talking about the heartland of the land, the, the very heart of, of the land here. Um, let's look at some pictures of this area. <clears throat> so here's a picture. The hill country is a beautiful and safe place. It's a beautiful and safe part of the land. The hills are windy, they're steep. There's not a straight line out there in this whole area. It gets some decent rainfall. You can see there's lots of green out there. It's a good place to grow grapes and olives and, and all that kind of stuff. This is the dreamland for God's people. You can see several times in the Bible when reading like 1 Kings chapter 4 and different places where you read about the ideal life that the, God's people uh, aspire to. And it would say things like each person under his own vine and each person under his own fig tree. That's, that's the hill country of Judah kind of stuff. And that's, that's this area here. It's rural. It's rural. You can see on the next picture here, travelers don't go there much. Uh, in fact, travelers usually don't go through most of the land. The, it's, it's basically the vast majority of it is accessed by just footpaths, local paths only. It's the home of a very conservative, peaceful people. Very conservative, peaceful people. Maybe if you, if you like the Lord of the Rings, it's a bit like the Shire. Armies never go here. Battles are never fought here. It's a peaceful place to, to, to just live, a live a simple life. You can see in the next picture here, uh, there are not many, uh, oh, not that picture, backing up. Uh, there are not many um, Bible stories that take place out here because... Um, because not much happens. It's a safe place. Bible stories are often, often written about, you know, conflict or political intrigue and all that kind of stuff. Probably the most famous story that takes place out here is the story of Mary. When she's pregnant, she comes and she visits, uh, she, she visits Jesus, uh, Elizabeth. She visits Elizabeth, her cousin, and they, they meet up down in this area. She gets out of the 
the people area of Nazareth, and she comes to this out-of-the-way place to kind of hide from the scandal of her being pregnant and, and not married. And so she stays here for, for several months. It's also, consequently, the area that John the Baptist grows up. Fun fact, and you saw this just a second ago on the slide, um, the, the, it, when we're talking about the birth of Jesus, this is what mangers looked like in the hill country of Judah, which includes, uh, which includes F, uh, Bethlehem. You can see yeah, they're stone, they're chiseled out. I mean, this is, this is what, when you're thinking of the Christmas story, there you go. That's most, most, that's pretty much almost certain what it, it looks like. That's just what they looked like uh, in, in this area. That's uh, just this fun bonus stuff. Um, the hill country to the south is a bit more dry, and it's a little less slopey. No, not that one. Uh, back it up. It's, it's a little bit more slopey. The hill country was this ideal place for, um, for most people, uh, a land to live in peace and contentment. Um, but, but yeah, the further you go south, the, the, less, the less slopes there was. Okay, so that's, that's a vibe of the area, just kind of a, a pictorial vibe of the area. Now, it's a, it's a simple place, but it's not a holiday. This is a land where you, want to, where you need to learn how to live by faith, just like all the other parts of the promised land. Now, so you might think, well, hey, if I have beauty and safety and, and security, then that would be enough. But friends, every part of the land... Every part of life has its own challenges, has its own challenges, and, and it's, it's the challenging areas where we are tested, whether we are going to live by faith, not just faith out there, but by faith in the day-to-day, faith that, um, that, that you can see and, and that, that is uh, testable. What is the day-to-day like uh, in the hill country? Well, first of all, it is a land of peace but not laziness it's a land of very hard work now here's here's a, a picture of terraced farming here at terraced farming now these happen to be olive trees as you can see but in order to grow food on the hillsides you would you would have to build a a wall a, a terraced a wall like a stone wall and then you would put good soil in it in order for things to grow. And so you, they, would, they would stair step it up. Here's a close-up picture of, of what it looked like. In my memory when I was there, I remember being told that they would build the wall and then the, and they, they would fill it with dirt, but not just with any dirt. They would take the dirt from the very bottom of the hill because that had the best soil, all the good nutrient soils rushing down to the bottom of the hill. So they would bring it up bucket by bucket, wheelbarrow by wheelbarrow full, however high they needed to go up, and they would fill in. It was a massive labor work to fill in all of the, the, the terrace from retainment wall to to the to the the back wall and and not only that every year every year they would have to bring up new dirt because um, some of it would wash away and so it was it was just this year round constant constant work they didn't just have the work of being a farmer they had to be a work of a farmer plus keeping the land from washing away here's what happens here's a picture of what happens if you're not very attentive to your terrace uh, it breaks. And, and, it, and it collapses in a single rainfall. You may not notice that it's about to break unless you're very attentive to it. But all of a sudden, in one rainfall, the terrace can break and the, the dirt and, and all the soil that you've, uh, you've hauled up from the bottom of the hill can just, can just wash away and you can lose your, whatever was growing there and you have to start all over. Which is awful, but it's even worse in this area. Because this isn't a land of grain where if you lose a grain crop, you, you don't have grain for the year. In this area, if you're growing, say, olive trees or, or vines, those, those, those uh, plants can take sometimes years to come into maturity. So you lose one, you lose an area, and you, you lose out on your income and your food and stuff for years if you're not attentive to the terrace. The hill country is a place of peace, but that doesn't mean that it's not a land of very hard work as well. Something else that I want you to know, 
Uh, it gets a decent amount of rain, about 24 to 28 inches a year. I mean, we, we scoff that that would be uh, rainfall, you know, here in Glasgow. But, but it, it, it doesn't really get enough rain for most people to live for, for their lives. There are a few springs, uh, very few springs here in, in the area which, which can support a very small community. Here's a picture of the the stream the, uh, of one of the streams now um, not streams but springs and there are there are lots of them uh, sorry there are not a lot of them uh, so there's these are pretty rare in the hill country there's good rainfall but there's not a lot of these these springs and one of the things that I think I've mentioned this before but there's no rivers that flow year-round in this area. There's no lakes. There's no streams that flow year-round. These springs, they do produce some water, but only enough for a, little, for a few people, and they don't produce a year-round stream, even trickle that would just run down the hill. They're, they're very limited uh, when it comes to the water situation here. In fact, here's some facts uh, connected to the water situation. The average American family of three, the only reason I have this is because my statistics just happen to come from an American, uh, uses 118,000 gallons of water per year. Okay, that's, that's fine. That's just, just FYI. Wow, that's super fun to know. Thank you, Brian, for wasting our time. No, uh, here, here's, how it, here's how it connects, though. According to the WHO, the World Health Organization, the minimum, the minimum amount of water needed according to the WHO, for a family of six is 11,600 gallons per year. Minimum water family of six, according to World Health Organization. Now, in this part, in, in, in this area, the average family of six had only 50, 5,300 gallons of water per year. So instead of 11,600, they only had 5,000 300. That is, that's less than half. People that less than half, what the WHO says is the required, uh, the needed minimum for a family of six. So, so that's, that's one of the situations with the people. How did they deal with this? How did they deal with this minute? Well, how they dealt with this, they were creative with what they did have. They didn't freak out about what they didn't have, and they were created. Most of them grew grapes, and so the juice of the grapes would supplement, uh, would supplement the water shortages. Uh, they would ferment the, the juice to last longer throughout the year. But yeah, they creatively adapted to the water shortages. Um, in, wine was not a luxury item. It, it, it was a requirement for them to have enough of, of liquid for their family for, for a year. In areas where they had animals, milk would sup, uh, supplement the water shortages. In areas where they grew pomegranates, pomegranate juice would supplement. You, you get the idea. Um, they, they, were, they had a water shortage that they were creative in dealing with. Now, the last thing I want to say about this area was although they worked hard on farming, and although they would creatively overcome their water shortage issues, in a normal year, their food supply ran 60 days short of a full year. They would run out of food 60 days short of a full year. In most years, in the normal year, there was a 60-day gap between when last year's food ran out and next year's harvest came in. How do you love that idea? How do you love that idea? Living each year, uncertain as how you and your family are going to be able to make it the last 60 days of the year. Will God provide? Will God provide for us when our food is expected to run out well before the next batch comes in? Let me add one more layer to this, to this uh, faith challenge, this faith pressure. In a normal year, their food would run out 60 days short, and yet God was still calling them to bring their first and their best, in their case 20% back then, to, to God as an offering, as an offering of faith, saying, I trust you to provide for me. What a faith challenge, right? 
They can see that they don't have enough for, for, the, for the whole year. And yet God calls them to keep trusting him, to live by faith, trusting him to provide. And even though they can't see how it's going to work and how it's figured out, God's calling them to live by very practical, challenging, everyday faith to bring their offerings first and trusting him with, with the rest. In fact, these words come from Haggai, or from God through Haggai, the prophet Haggai. They're written to the hill country people who lived in this area, in, 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 around Jerusalem, in the hill country here. God says to them, you have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. That's, that's part of the hill country conundrum. You eat, but never have enough to be satisfied. Food shortage. You drink, but never have enough to be happy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if we're talking about even just the water shortage issues here or the supplement. But you drink, but you never have enough to be happy. You, you put on clothes, but never have enough to get warm. The, the wage earner puts his wage into a bag with, with hole in it. And then basically, God calls these people who are struggling in the day-to-day -day to be able to make ends meet, to have enough food, to have enough to drink. Uh, to, he calls them to get the right stuff right first. He calls them to trust him and at first deal with his temple. Bring what needs to be done for the temple to be, to be rebuilt and sorted and, and to bring their offerings and to, 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 to put him first. And then he says, God will bless their home stuff and the home stuff will come together. But he's called us to sort God's stuff first and then see God's provision what a challenge, what a major faith challenge for these people, for these people living in the hill country. And, the, and the, the question that I have in my notes here is, would these people who obviously valued safety and security and peace, they obviously valued safety and security and peace, would these people trust God to provide enough food for their families to live if they bring their offerings to God first, even when they're already running short of food? Can they trust God to provide for their families what is lacking? What do you think they did? What would you do? What would you do? Well, these people, they, they usually struggled. They usually struggled to have that kind of faith. The, the land was perfect in every region for growing faith. And in every region, we see that people struggled to, to live by faith in the everyday. I love the hill country of Judah. And there's, there's four spiritual encouragements that, that I have for us from, from this part of the land. Four encouragements connected to living by faith in the everyday practical ways. The first encouragement is this. To be thankful for the goodness that you do have in your life. Be thankful for the goodness that you do have in your life. I'm thinking of the picture again of the terrace, uh, ter terrace farming in the, the, the hill country. Are you too focused on your, on your fears? Uh, or can you see the beauty right in front of you? Can you see the goodness in your life? Can you see the beauty right, right in front of you? Or are you too focused on your stresses, your, your anxieties? Can you see the things that are good in front of you that you can be thankful for? Can you recognize and celebrate the, the safety, even if you're worried about other things that are also significant? I know our Bible read-through groups are in very similar places. I keep seeing Paul writing throughout, uh, throughout these recent letters that we've been reading about the how soul, S-O-U-L, how soul important thankfulness is. How soul important thankfulness is. I can't encourage you enough, whatever your very genuine real stresses and challenges, to never get, give up being thankful out loud to God. Every day, continually. Um, Paul says to stay alert with thanksgiving, Colossians chapter 4. Paul says, let peace rule your heart and be thankful, Colossians chapter 3. 
Paul says, don't worry. Keep praying with thankfulness. Philippians chapter 4. Paul says, give thanks always. Ephesians chapter 5. All through Paul's writing, he keeps reminding us of how soul crucial thankfulness is to, to live a life in, in, in faith. You're going to collapse on the inside with the stresses, anxieties, and fears if you don't stay thankful for the beauty that is in your life, the goodness that is right in front of you that you have been given. Can you see that? Can you see it even, even in these challenging days? That's, that's, encur that's encouragement number one. Be thankful for the goodness that you do have in your life. The second lesson from, the, from the, the, the terrace farming is be diligent and keep working hard on your soul. Be diligent and keep working hard on your soul. I think that the picture here is that of the, the breaking of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the terrace wall. If you stop working on your, your spiritual life, your soul, things will fall apart quicker than you would normally expect. We kind of often think we can just coast for a while spiritually and it's probably going to be okay. It's fine. We can pick it up whenever, but we're just one rainstorm away from a collapse if we're, if we're doing that. Friends, many, not all, not all, many, many of the mental, uh, the mental issues, the mental emotional challenges that we have, uh, internal anxieties that we might have, and internal issues of darkness that we might have, anger issues that we might have, they're often, not, not entirely, but they're often connected to a neglected soul, to an under- cultivated soul. And I'm not saying this is the only issue at all, it, but it might be a bigger issue than, than you might be initially aware of. I am diligent working on my soul every morning, commanding my soul to be calm these days, uh, to, to commanding my soul to trust Jesus in these days, to not give way to stress and to fears and anxieties, but to be calm and to be patient and live with love and live with joy. And I'll tell you what, it is hard for me these days to live calm and peaceful and, 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 and trusting Jesus in these days. It is, a, it is a challenge, and some days I do better than ever. It is a battle, and I get that. But I, I need to keep working diligently on my soul, and, 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 and I encourage you to be very on top of your own soul day by day, day by day. The third encouragement that I see here is the lesson connected to the water shortage, and the lesson is be creative with what God has given you to make up for what he hasn't. Be creative with what God has given you to make up for what he hasn't. Again, this is the water, the, the water uh, shortage issue. Sometimes... God gives you enough, but it's not exactly what you were expecting it to be. I need water, not enough water. Okay. Now, this is a small point here, but sometimes we complain to God because of what we don't have. I don't have, you know, close friends right now, or I don't have money in the bank, or I don't have this happy situation, or, or whatever. I like the hill country lessons because these people work hard. And when they don't have enough, they, they're going to get creative to try and overcome the challenges that they have as creatively and as, as best as they can uh, themselves. And I encourage you that too, to be praying and to be asking God to help you and to provide for you while you're working as hard as you can to keep things together, while you're making as many creative adjustments as you can. Sometimes God's provided for you already, and you just need to see it and, and then to be creative with that. But the days do come when there is nothing left. There isn't any more creative things that we can do. And in those moments, living by faith gets, gets gritty. It gets, it gets really real, gritty real, right? Right? And so the challenge in those moments when, when, when our faith is being tested, number four, is get the God stuff right and then trust him with the rest. Get the God stuff right and then trust him with the rest. Now, I know 
a lot of people in our church live in this hill country type pressure. We're month by month, week by week, tempted to not trust God first with their money situation. They're going to make sure that they had enough for the month, and then maybe they'll give God whatever might be left or whatever. They can see when they look forward that there isn't maybe enough to get through the month. There isn't enough for the plans and priorities that they have. And so they decide to skip the, the offering thing because money is tight and it's uncomfortable right now. But friends, it's actually when money is most tight that trusting God is most powerful. It, it, it's when, when money is most tight that trusting God is most real. Real. It's, it, we we want to be like, I'll trust God when there's nothing to trust. When it comes to my finances. I'll trust him for, for extra. When I already have surplus. For even more surplus. But, but it's, it's when money is tight that that's when, when we're called to actually genuinely live by faith. And when you don't see how it's going to work out. But you choose to trust God anyways. That's where faith gets real. That's where everyday faith happens. God, God you say, if I put you first, you will provide. Okay. Okay. That's, I'm going to live that way, and I'm going to trust you. Now, you, if you've been around Rehope for a while, you know we don't actually talk about money very much. Uh, we don't talk about money very much, but I, I do want you to not forget that living with everyday faith does include trusting God by actually giving your offerings to, to the church first before even you see how God might end up providing for you. We have heard so many stories over the years of people doing just that, not sure how it's going to happen, choosing to trust God, and then they're then testifying to that. I encourage you, if, if this is going to be your experience, if this is your experience, to, um, to, to be testifying, to be testifying on the chats, to be testifying, you know, during share times or whatever, and just be like, cultivate other people's faith. Because as you know, if you've ever been at this moment, it can be scary to trust God when you don't see how it's going to come together or how it can even come together. That's what living with everyday faith looks like. Maybe that's your faith challenge today. Um, I've got three challenges for us as a church. Challenge number one, I want you to praise God for seven things that you're thankful for. Seven, I know. It's ridiculous that I put such a small number there. Um, I, I, I want that, hopefully that'll just be a starting point and you'll be like, I can't help but add a few more. Uh, a few more. If, if, yeah, praise God for seven things you're thankful for. Cultivate that thankful, uh, that identifying of the thankful. Secondly, if you've been neglecting your soul, I, I, try to try some of these Zoom calls that we're doing, the 8 a.m., the 8 p.m. In fact, I specifically challenge you to try and make four of them. I don't c care which four, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Um, there's, there's eight total. Try and make four of them. And just to, if, if you feel like you've been neglecting your soul, it's a very easy way to re-engage, to hear the Psalms, and to just be praying with people. Um, I encourage you to take that step. And thirdly, if giving, if your giving isn't reflecting trusting God first, then make the adjustment today. You'll see a link that's going to appear on the chat in a little bit, but make, make the adjustment today. You can go online to the website and do that as well. But I know that this is gritty, this is very uh, gritty stuff, what we're talking about when it comes to actually living by faith. The, we are not the first generation to, to face the, these kinds of things. In fact, every generation faces these same sort of things. So I want to bless you, I want to bless you and pray for you that you would have great faith and audacity and that you would see God's um, provision and sustaining of you in your life, whatever your context and whatever your situation. Let me, let me pray for you. God, you are good. You are good. You have been good to us. You have been good to each one of us. And we look to you to provide uh, answers to prayer, to provide uh, the answers to things that we seek. We, 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 we look to you to provide financially for, for us and for your people. We... we we look to you to be to us who the Bible says you are, the extremely reliable provider and sustainer. The one who does not let our foot slip, 
and who leads us, uh, who leads us into uh, where you'd want us to go. God, I just bless everyone's uh, financial situation now in the name of Jesus, God, that you would provide all that they need and more, that there would be nothing that is that we lack, that not a single meal would be missed as we follow you in faith, and that we would, uh, that we would have, uh, yeah, we, that you, we would be provided for as you, as you say we will be in your word. God, I ask for a special blessing for those who step out in this area of, of giving and, and offerings. God, that you would prove your, yourself to them very clearly uh, by being their great provider. I pray for faith to grow in us all. And for unbelief to go down, for doubts and fears to, be, to go down, and for a great swelling of faith as we step forward in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.